I just wanted to say very briefly that I was invited to come here by Maxime Dahan, who, as many of you in the in the field of biophysics understand that he was, he's been a tremendous source of energy in the field. Um, Maxime, I met Maxime actually at a course not so dissimilar from this one, except it was in, a, in the summer. It was a summer school in Les Uches, and um, it was maybe in the year 2000, so that tells you how old I am, although I was a PhD student at the time. And already, you know, I could see that Maxime was uh, incredibly engaged always asking questions. And I see that um, in this room, there, there's a lot of passion and talent for biophysics. So it's really exciting for me to be here and to be part of this experience. So um, today I'm going to tell you about my adventures, the adventures of my team in super resolution microscopy. And so it's gonna be a talk that mixes between um, sort of our flavor of biophysics, which is about mitochondrial division and bacterial division with a focus on bacteria and also method development. So for me, these two things have gone hand in hand. The methods allow us to see things that we couldn't see before. And one of the goals is to be very quantitative so we can test models um, and also to collect large enough amounts of data that we can begin to uh, think about things from a statistical mechanics standpoint, although I won't go deeply into that, uh, into that direction given the, the limited amount of time I have with you. So just as a very brief introduction into super resolution microscopy, um, the idea behind the type that we do, which is mostly um, localization microscopy as it's known, is that you can think about the molecules that you're imaging in a fluorescence image, for example, as living in you know, three-dimensional space. Um, but if you could actually spread those molecules over an additional dimension, which in this case we think of as time, then you could actually separate them. So the, here's the time axis. And here in different frames in time, we collect different molecules. And these molecules then we can use a very strong prior knowledge, which is that each of them is probably a single molecule. We can use that strong prior plus the information from all the photons that we collect. So the more photons we get, the more information we have on the position of that molecule to then uh, 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 create a super resolved image. But here, you know, so this is the, the standard type of image that you would get if you just integrated over time each of these molecules which has been separated in space. And the idea then is instead of just integrating them, uh, integrating all those molecules over time, we instead use the temporally separated information to localize single molecules and then uh, create a composite image based on those highly localized uh, single molecules. And so here's what uh, this looks like in In the case of these lysosomes, which are being imaged um, back in the day when you know, this method was first being developed uh, in the lab of Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz by Eric Betzig and Her Harold Hess. And so here you see the molecules blinking over time. So this is a real data, raw data. And if you just sum them, then you come out with something which is diffraction limited. And here is the super resolved image. Of course, this brings to uh, light immediately an interesting feature of this type of imaging, which is that here I've taken just 300 frames of that movie uh, and, and integrated the, the, the molecule localizations. And so it actually doesn't recover the shape extremely well. And so an important aspect of localization microscopy is that even if you can localize single molecules to nanometric precision, which you can with a lot of photons, um, there's still the question of resolving an object, which requires that you decorate it densely enough that you can actually see the object. And so this, um, you know, after 20,000 frames, you start to be able to see with higher fidelity the actual organization of lysosomes. And here you see the different lysosomal membranes. And this is all from the original uh, science paper by Betzig. Now in my group, we've extended or, or been using uh, localization microscopy and also structured illumination microscopy 
to study these processes of bacterial and mitochondrial division. And one of the, the reasons that I think this system is so enticing for studying with super resolution microscopy is that they're about the right size. So 500 nanometers, we know that the diffraction limited uh, resolution is about the wavelength of light or half the wavelength of light. And so for visible light, we're right at that limit. And as you go through these shape transitions that are associated with division, then you eventually hit the singularity here, right? When you, the cells actually divide. If you want to study this process of division, then it's actually a, a huge help to have super resolution. And so um, this is, uh, I'm going to now tell you about some of the work we've done on, on bacterial cell division. And to start to do so, I should tell you about what some of the molecular players are. And so here's a schematic drawn by one of my collaborators, Erin Goley, where she's uh, put in place in this cartoon uh, many of the different proteins that have ident been identified as being involved with bacterial cell division. So the idea is that during division, all these molecules come together at the middle of the cell, where the cell should divide, and they create a sort of machine that then remodels or generates forces to constrain the, member, uh, cons constrain the bacterial envelope, which is here composed of an outer membrane, an inner membrane, and a relatively thick uh, cell wall. So it's different than our membranes, of course. Um, so we, what we started thinking about was, you know, um, well, it turns out that there, one of the interesting players in bacterial cell division is this protein called FDSZ. And you'll see that it's unique among this cartoon here in the sense that it forms these filaments. And FDSZ was identified as being a, a tubulin homologue, and so it was a prime candidate for a generator of force in, in allowing the cell to deform um, at the division site. And so this was the first um, target that we started looking at. And many of these other proteins are involved in peptidoglycan remodeling, so cell wall remodeling and changing the shape and, um, and, and actually building the cell wall at mid-cell. And so we're going to come back to that second class a little bit later. Okay, so, but our first target was FDSZ, which forms a structure that's known as the Z ring. Um, and so, you know, there are a bunch of studies already out there, and it's always a little bit uh, perhaps intimidating when you come in as a physicist and there's a system that's ex actually quite well studied from a biological aspect and even from a structural aspect. Um, and, and I'll tell you uh, more about why we still threw our hat in the ring. So um, what people had seen was, you know, in different kinds of bacteria, Colobacter, Bacillus, uh, Subtilis, E. coli, people had seen different things about the way that the Z-ring actually looks. And so in, in cryo-EM, people had seen that something that looked rather filamentous and patchy, um, and B-sub, something that looked sometimes a little bit gapped. Um, in Colobacter in Palm, they had seen something that looked much more continuous, and then e in E. coli, they saw something that looked kind of helical. And so there are all these different ideas about what the Z-ring looks like, and why do people care what the Z-ring looks like, right? So why people care what the Z-ring looks like, at least from our perspective, is because it, it gives you different ideas about how the cell is actually dividing. And so in the case that you have a continuous ring or helix, you could imagine that um, this is a contractile, this could be a contractile ring. And this is, um, this is supported by the fact that FDSZ is, a, is, as I said, a tubulin homolog, so it, it can form these filaments, but it can also act to hydrolyze GTP, so it can burn energy. And as it burns energy, it changes conformational state and bends these filaments. And there was this rather nice estimate that was done by Casey Wong, um, where he shows that the kinds of forces that can be generated by this uh, hydro hydrolysis-driven bending is would be sufficient to bend a lipid bilayer membrane. So this is quite attractive in that sense. On the other hand, if you, suppose you have a patchy band, a not a complete or continuous ring. In this case, um, you know, there, people still try to attribute a force generating kind of role um, where they suggested that there might be some kind of iterative pinching or ratcheting that's formed by these very dynamic and patchy filaments. But it's much harder actually to imagine that the main role of this structure is to generate force if it really is this kind of patchy structure. 
So the reason that we kind of decided to, to, to um, go after this problem is because many of these studies that I mentioned um, are, are reporting on, say, between 10 and 20 cells. And a typical, um, a, a typical study would only show you very few examples of what the ring looked like. And none of them actually were looking at the ring as a function of cell cycle which is a little bit odd when you consider that this is a key cell cycle machine. And so um, the, the approach that we took was to uh, develop an instrumentation in a, um, to be able to image hundreds of thousands of cells in a single experiment. And the idea is that we wanted to image cells um, that were living, to avoid, both to avoid fixation artifacts and also to be able to allow them to proceed through cell cycle. And so the strategy that we took was we took our bacteria cells and we could synchronize them. We're using a, the Colobacter crescentis bug, which is a, a great model system for cell cycle because you can actually just by centrifugation and not using any kind of drugs, you can synchronize these cells. And then we plated them on a pad, actually Seamus did, who was a, a postdoc in my lab at the time. And he programmed a microscope to be able to scan multiple fields of view. And in each field of view, he collected um, or rather, the, our, our automated microscope collected both a phase contrast image and a single molecule fluorescence image. And from these two images, we could then figure out the context for the fluorescence, that is to build up a cell outline, and to localize in 3D these single molecules to be able to recreate what the Z-ring looks like as a function of time. And of course, in this case, we think of the time of the measurement as a pseudo time during cell cycles since all of the cells were synchronized at the beginning of the experiment. And so in this way, and I'm showing just a few examples where you know, these are at the early times and then here at the later times, um, where you can see quite clearly that many of these rings are quite patchy, although occasionally you come uh, to one which would be, we would classify as being continuous. And so um, from, this, we're, from these, these types of data sets, we were able to um, quantify the populations that lived in each of these, you know, patchy, um, incomplete, or full ring. So patchy is the green, um, incomplete is the purple, where you still have significant gaps. And then the fully closed ring um, is consistent with the idea that, in fact, the, the filaments are relatively short and patchy, but occasionally they happen to stochastically overlap to form what looks like a complete ring. And so the idea is that this supports this model that it must be sort of a patchy band, at least for Colobacter, and, um, over, and, and all across cell cycles. So these are, as a function of cell cycle, the, the time post-synchrony, so the um, function of the, the time um, during cell cycle. And the idea is then that um, FDZ is really forming this very patchy ring um, that eventually, uh, you know, eventually starts to, to close up, but, but always looks quite patchy and, and um, then it forms a spot at the very end. And so this supports this idea that, in fact, um, FDSZ was, is, is not truly a, a force generator. And there's been work that's come along later that supports this idea that FDSZ is actually very dynamic. And it actually does things like treadmilling, which you see in um, human uh, tubulin or mammalian tubulin uh, networks. So back to um, you know thinking one of the things that came up during, our, during this study was, you know, we started to think about um, the division process itself and, and how the cell generates its, its pole shape. And so we wanted to start looking at, um, you know, how, how it could be that these different um, uh, remodelers of the cell wall together with, the, with uh, this tubulin homolog could actually decide that the cell should, should close in a, at a certain rate and, and with a certain shape. And so um, we encountered this body of literature on you know, how populations of bacteria actually manage to maintain their size. So this is called um, cell size control or cell size homeostasis. And of course, the goal of, of, a, of a population of cells we think of as being, you know, it sort of optimizes its size, maybe based on the conditions. But what you want to avoid is sort of population drift over, just over time. Um, for example, if, you know, um, if, if a cell is, 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 is purely um, sort of timing how long it is bet between divisions, then perhaps a, a, small, a small perturbation in, in its size in one division would lead to a, a drift toward longer cell, cell size, for example. Anyways, um, you know, 
A lot of models have been built up over the past 50 plus years about how, how, how homeostasis is maintained. And I'm not going to really get, get into them here just because there's not enough time. But their, their names are quite evocative, <laughs> at least as we call them now, you know, sizer, timer, and adder. Um, this, is, these, this is saying what the cell is sort of measuring. The cell is measuring its own size and saying, now I'm going to divide. Or the cell is measuring the time since the last division and saying, now I'm going to divide. Or the last one, the cell is saying, how much did I add since the last division? And then deciding based on that when it's going to divide. But all of these models had, again, in common something, which is that typically they're thinking about each of these as setting the, the point at which the zeroing or the, the, the whole um, division machinery is going to onset to, to create, uh, to, to, to start division. And so we think of this, uh, all of these models so far is really just considering control of the onset of constriction. Um, and we wanted to think about, in fact, the control of the constriction rate itself. And why do we think that this might be interesting? Well, it turns out that uh, cells, and in particular colobacter, can spend up to 40% of their cell cycle in the constriction phase. So the idea is first cells elongate all along their, um, their, their uh, cylindrical wall. And then at the end, though, um, you know, they constrict and divide. But that part was sort of thrown away. But it turns out that this is actually a, a tremendously long part of the cell cycle. And so we wondered, you know, um, whether cells could also, besides deciding, you know, I'm going to be, I, I want to be small for whatever reason. There's, you know, um, in terms, you know, it's measuring the nutrients or, or what, what, what have you in the, in, the, in the environment. It decides it wants to be small, and so it early onsets um, division um, versus late. Um, we wondered whether cells could also use the strategy of dividing fast or slow. And so what we're doing in this case is we wanted to measure dynamics of single cells, and so we're using a different method, which is called uh, uh, structured illumination microscopy. And here the work was largely done by Amboise Lambert. And he studied cells that, um, strains that he had made to express both a cell wall marker and um, FDSC together. So with FDSC, you can measure the, the arrival of the divisome and um, with the shape of uh, the cell wall protein, um, you can measure the shape, of course. And so what he found was that if you divided the amount of elongation into two sort of con contributions, one being elongation before constriction and the other being the, what's missing between constriction and division, which is the elongation um, during constriction. So for each of these um, pairs of points represents a single cell, um, then you can see that uh, Cells that elongate less before constriction elongate more um, during constriction. And so it appears, and, and so we also did this for a, for a mutant. This is a mutant in one of those, actually two of those um, cell wall remodeling enzymes. And you can see that similarly here, we also see this sort of compensation. The less you elongate before constriction, the more you elongate during, and vice versa. So we wondered where this might be coming from. And um, so here we're looking at actually the size of this constriction site, so the normalized waste width, um, as a function of the time during constriction. Again, normalized um, for the total time of, of, of the cell cycle. And what we found was, well, as you would expect again, um, if you elongate a little uh, um, during, uh, during el the elongation phase, then you elongate for a very long time so this dark blue is the longest, you know, the, the cell that's elongated least during, during elongation. It, it takes a very long time to actually constrict and divide. Now, we can look at, you know, the time-resolved information for each of these individual curves. So each of these individual curves corresponds to a single bacteria. And now we can ask, well, what is the constriction rate in the early part of this constriction versus the constriction rate late? And how does it correlate with the elongation before constriction? And it turns out that this compensation that I mentioned, that cells are making up for how much they elongated early on, is actually taking place in the early part of constriction. And so it's not like a late, you know, it's not like the cell just gets to the end and it kind of waits um, while it elongates enough. It's really doing something early on during that constriction phase. And so how can we understand this? 
Um, well, I'm going to take you for a minute back to the adder model, which I didn't explain in, compl in full. But the idea, one, one of the um, justifications for how the adder might, model might arise is um, by thinking about the way that the volume and the area of the, of the cell might scale. Um, and so this, this is a model that was developed by Julie Terrio's lab, and it's described in the cell paper from 2016. So the idea that they, that, they, um, that they put forward is that perhaps, you know, the, uh, the, um, the rate of synthesizing the volume instantaneously at any given time is proportional to its volume at that time. And this makes sense because cells grow exponentially. So this is consistent with what, what is observed. Um, the conjecture that they made is that the rate of the surface area increase would also scale with the volume. That is to say, you know, so proteins are made in the volume. And so the more volume you have, the more machines you have to make protein, and the more constituents you have. And so the volume is setting kind of the concentration of all the components in the cell. And perhaps what they're saying is, perhaps the area itself is sensitive to those concentrations. So the higher the concentration, the more I'm going <coughs> to increase my surface area. And so from this, of course, you, you, um, this gives rise to two exponentials, exponential of the surface area and exponential of the volume with respect to time, with, this, with the same single, with a shared um, time constant, 1 over alpha. And, um, the idea that they, that they extrapolated from here is that um, what if you look not only at the surface area to volume, which from this they, they, um, they postulate should arrive at a, a, a constant over populations, but you also, think you, can, you also can think about this in terms of what's left over. So as the cell's shape changes, as it goes through this elongation, it starts out being somewhat more spherical then it ends up, right? So just before it divides, it's the least spherical um, shape that's sort of illustrated here. So the idea is that you're actually accumulating these cell wall precursors over time. And this would give rise to potentially a sort of critical level or a threshold level of, 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 of these cell wall precursors that would then trigger um, cell division. Again, this is not thinking at all about constriction rate. So how do we think about how this might give rise to an additional level of control um, in constriction rate? Well, first of all, we tested this idea um, that constriction rate might be related to this precursor excess as well by estimating the precursor excess based on the geometry of our cells, which we can measure very precisely using super resolution. And we found indeed that for both, of the, both the mutant and the wild type, that the constriction rate correlated positively with the estimated excess. And so the idea that we have is, is in cartoon form here, um, that at, over time the precursor excess increases, but it's a noisy process, as all biological processes are, and sometimes you overshoot a bit. Suppose you overshoot a bit. In that case, if your constriction rate itself depends on the precursor concentration, now you're going to divide a bit faster. And it just so happens that this is a, a good signature for having grown to be too long, longer than you want to be. And so this is our, um, our, our very hypothetical model for how individual cells might be able to compensate the noise in the onset process by modulating the constriction rate. So just to give a bit of an outlook on this part, this half of the talk, um, so we've, we've, I've shown that you know, FDSZ seems to be very patchy rather than, than highly um, continuous. So it's unlikely to be generating these long range forces, at least, um, that cell populations can achieve a higher fidelity adder to better maintain their, their size control by compensating um, the, the rate of constriction. Um, and currently, we're moving on. And we're looking at now at bacteria that are under starvation, where they actually form condensed phases that in some cases are, are somewhat similar to what um, Tony Hyman was talking about this morning. Um, I also mentioned that we're working on mitochondria, and we haven't published in this area yet, but we have a paper on the bioarchive in case you're curious. And we're very interested in um, the kinds, again, the kinds of forces um, that 
arise and allow the mitochondria to constrict at the at mitochondrial division sites, but also how these how these sites are positioned. Because while in bacteria cells, it's, it's, it's very well known that there are certain gradients that set, that, al that allow um, the cell to de detect where its middle is, to measure itself, so to speak. Um, much less is known about mitochondria. And we've actually, um, there's a, a, a postdoc in my group who has um, done quite a, a lot of statistics to show that, in fact, it's not a random process. And so there's a, a really weird pattern that emerges, actu emerges actually as to where the mitochondria divide. Um, and an open and unknown uh, question, which I think is physical and bizarre that it's not really known, is how mitochondria actually manage to maintain their highly elongated shape. Of course, we know that the, in the absence of a, of a cytoskeleton, um, you know, they, they round up. But that doesn't really answer the question in, in any sort of model or detailed way as to how they actually um, have, have, have the shape that they have. OK, so now I'm going to shift gears um, for the last 15 minutes or so to talk more about methodology. Um, but I hope you en enjoyed this, this interlude on um, uh, the, the biophysics of, of bacterial division and, and mitochondria. So, of course, the Z-ring itself is what I, or the divisome itself is what I could call a, a cellular machine. Um, but there are many other cellular machines that are often the gatekeepers or the organizing centers of the cell. Um, so examples being the nuclear pore complex um, or centrosomes. And um, you know, super resolution has also had a huge impact in terms of, in terms of revealing the organization of different cellular machines since you know, although many of them fall below the length scales that are accessible by uh, super resolution, so they need to be addressed more by cryo EM or X-ray, um, there's this whole range of machine sizes between, you know, about 10 and up to, you know, uh, even 1,000 nanometers. If, if things were that large, we'd have no problem measuring where things really become, start to, uh, start to become a problem for these other methodologies. So there's, you know, I've, I've, I've tried to cite a, a lot of the works that have been done here. Um, and one of the things that people have used, so to go beyond um, the, the resolutions that you can readily achieve uh, using, using localization microscopy in particular, is that if you could, as you can for these machines, if you could assume um, that, these, that instances of these machines are identical, then you could actually further, <laughs> is there a vacuum cleaner in here? Um, then you could actually further enhance your resolution by doing even more averaging. OK, so the idea is to do 2D particle averaging. And this is something that's been done in, um, in, uh, with electron microscopy data uh, with, with great results. Um, so the basic idea is illustrated here, where you have individual particles, as we'll call them. So a particle here is a single instance of a machine that you would image. And so each of these particles is somewhat patchy or incomplete. Um, and so the idea is that here, your prior is that all of these are the same. And if you impose that, then you can say, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to align these over their center of mass. So, uh, for example, I'm going to cross-correlate them to figure out whether there's any additional um, kinds of uh, um, of information that, that I can extract. And then I'm going to add all of this information together to come up with an average sum of all these individual particles. And this will indeed allow me to now begin to deduce what the underlying um, symmetry in this particle is. And of course, you know, you can think about simple examples like this cube where you would have um, multiple projections. And the, the key point here is that, you know, this. This example is really what people have been doing with super resolution, and it's all very much 2D. Um, but in reality, um, objects are often living in 3D. And so if we ha are, have the access to this um, uh, multiple orientations of an object, then we can go further than just getting the 2D symmetry. Um, we can go into 3D. And so that's what is done um, in this beautiful example of a Lego sculpture which is 
<laughs> Shows you that you're never too old to play with Legos. Um, I like the butterfly in particular. It's really remarkable. This is a, this is a scientist actually who does this in his spare time. He has um, sculptures made from all different kinds of materials. And he's actually an NMR scientist um, who's at, uh, who's, who lives outside of Chicago. Um, so he calls those magic at angle sculptures. Anyway, so you know, the idea that we want to implement we, is, is to then use this type of idea where you take the shadows, you take the projections, and you use then a computational um, framework to, uh, to deduce what the most likely 3D structure is that, ge that gave you those projections. And so what do you need to be able to do this? Well, you need, first of all, lots and lots of particles, because you need to uh, span all of this uh, angular projection space, this Euler angle space, very nicely. And of course, we want them then to uh, take on lots of different orientations. You know, the effect of the particles is, is also just to enhance um, the, 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 the coverage of the, the particle. And so how do we collect lots of particles? Well. You may not have looked at that carefully if you're not a connoisseur at the uh, initial data that I showed you, this lysosome movie. But you have to realize that the whole field of view in that lysosome movie was probably five microns at most. And you know, it turns out that there's a reason for that, and it's because in this field of super resolution localization microscopy, typically what we're doing is we're cropping. And we crop our field of view because, um, um, there's, a, because there's a problem. And um, this problem became even more uh, clear when people moved from these relatively small detectors called EMCCD cameras <laughs> to these larger detectors called SCMOS detectors. Um, and you know, initially, there were a couple of publications, so both in, in um, the, the, the resolved microscopy which is uh, Stefan Hell's version of, of, of using fluorescent proteins for, for stead-like microscopy, and in, um, and in localization microscopy. But you quickly realize that you know, what we could wash away a little bit with, or brush under the carpet a, a little bit with, with EMCCDs, because we just you know, crop to, say, a quarter, and we say, oh, it's, it's almost the size. Um, now you run into real issues, because, so this is an example of a real, um, acquisition. And you can see that we're illuminating with this Gaussian kind of beam. And this beam, although it sort of fills the field of view, it doesn't have enough power to really switch the molecules um, between these states to, to give you this, this temporal separation of single molecules over the whole field of view. And in fact, you can see perhaps that in the middle, molecules are um, less dense than they are in this sort of ring and so on. So there's actually a spatial dependence that goes beyond what, what you would expect um, if you were using, if you were doing some kind of linear microscopy. So my point is that just that the nonlinearity that's required by switching molecules is actually enhanced by the fact, um, or the, 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 the issue of the, the non-uniform field is enhanced by the nonlinearities that exist in this type of microscopy. And so if you do other kinds of microscopy, just wide field microscopy, um, people always correct for non-flatness of the field. But this is actually something you cannot correct for because it's nonlinear and because um, the molecules out here simply are just not switching. And so it's not a question of, of enough, it's just they're not. And so the idea was to just you know, create a flat laser beam. Um, and the issue arises because you know, there are flat shapers, flat top shapers out there, but people really hadn't worked with these high numerical aperture objectives. And there are all sorts of issues that, that arise when you try to do this very efficiently, to squeeze light in a flat form um, into the, into the um, ap back aperture of these objectives. And so a postdoc in my lab luckily joined my group. He, he had been working um, in, uh, he had trained as an optic, optical physicist, and he came up with this idea that's based on a, a setup that's known as the Kohler um, integrator, not the Kohler illuminator, but the Kohler integrator. And it's actually quite simple if you break it down. So here's a telescope with a rotating diffuser that's intended to slightly decohere the light. And here are two micro lens arrays that then um, mix both angular and um, spatial uh, contributions to the light. <coughs> 
And this allows us to then obtain a, a flat field. Now, the, the placement of each of these optics is actually relatively important. And so he wrote a, a wave optic simulator to be able to, to place the optics. And this is something we offer um, to groups who are interested. You know, I can give you a parts list. It's about uh, 5K. And the, the simulator is free online, of course. And so with this, we're now able to collect these really large field of view, 150 by 150 micron, um, with nice and uniform resolution. This is a little bit more of an interlude, which is related to the first part of the talk. So we also do structural illumination microscopy um, in the form of instant sim. And um, here, as well, you run into this problem. If you come in with a Gaussian beam, you actually end up with a non-flat um, illumination of your, of your sample. And we can fix this using a solution that my student Dora actually came up with, which is slightly different from what I showed you earlier. And using this, this is um, one of the nice things about the iSIM is that you can, it, it truly is instant, so you can go up to 100 frames per second, um, super fast for cellular processes. It can be really nice for looking at the ER, for example, as, as she is here. Um, the idea is now, again, you can create these really large fields of view super fast, perhaps even too fast, right? Because a lot of processes are actually not taking place on this time scale. So instead, perhaps what you'd like to do is what she's done here, which is to share, to do time sharing between multi multiple fields of view. So here's a um, four by four uh, field of view where she's stitched together images in, in a um, 4.5 second um, time frame and to be able to collect larger images on a, um, on a longer uh, time scale. Back to the 3D, 3D reconstruction centriole. I hope I didn't give you whiplash just now. Um, but flat is really essential if you want to collect large, high quality data sets. And so let that, let that be an emphasis um, for people who want to be quantitative. I think you know, controlling your illumination is really an important aspect of microscopy. So the Centrio is actually an example of a organelle that's, um, or the centrosome is the, an example of an organelle that Tony Hyman has shown is, is likely to be one of these phase separated organelles. But at the heart of the, the centrosome is the centriole, which has a, a well-defined organization. So it's one of these examples of a structural machine that organizes the cell's polarity, allows cells to divide into just two, in a very um, um, controlled fashion. And one of the aspects of it is um, that it has to duplicate itself then once per cell cycle. And so here um, is the beginning of cell cycle, then you nucleate a daughter, two daughter centrioles, and then eventually um, you divide it into two daughter cells. So each daughter cell then inherits a single centriole. The organization of the centriole has been um, very beautifully defined in electron microscopy, but it turns out that there are more than 100 protein species involved. And so it's a really nice uh, system if you care about, um, uh, since you, you know, there are so many protein species, uh, to be able to have, use fluorescence and to say where individual species are, um, you know, super resolution is really a, a great tool for this. So one of the questions you know, just to go back a little bit to the biophysics of the process, how does it nucleate just a single one? This is an open question and one that we eventually hope to get to. But, you know, there's no really obvious broken symmetry when you look at the structure. And it's, again, it's in this, it's in this cloud of phase-separated matter, this centrosomal matter. So it's enriched in these proteins that will nucleate this single daughter uh, procentriole, but it's, you know, how does, it, how's it, how does it actually prune or nucleate to get just one? Um, so, you know, this is the direction we're moving in. But to get there first, you know, we want to get through 3D reconstruction. And so um, we collect these large data sets. Um, this is a single field of view, and here's a single pair of centrioles. Now, um, you know, so here's a montage of many of the particles that we can collect of this single centriole or protein, SEP152. And this is the pipeline that we use. So we do this imaging 
we do all the kinds of corrections and um, then we identify particles, we do a segmentation, so we crop out the images. Um, we filter the particles for quality, so you know, is this a, a particle that we can actually define its orientation? And we generate images from there. And then you know, we can use these data sets then, if we just take the top views, for example, to do, we could do 2D particle averaging, just like I showed you in the beginning of this section, where you can align by center of mass and then also cross-correlate to uh, deduce what the symmetry of this particle is. Um, but more excitingly, we can run this through electron microscopy-like software to reconstruct the 3D volume of this particular protein, CEP152. Now, this of course is a single color. Um, what we really wanted to do to, was to be able to figure out where these different proteins are with respect to each other and eventually to look at this the nascent daughter centriole. Um, so how are we going to do this? We're going to do this by doing two color imaging. And so you might say, well, why don't you just do five color imaging? And it's because it's really technically extremely hard to do. So it's obnoxiously hard to do three colors. And it's something sort of embarrassing, honestly. Um, you can do it, and there are tricks, and somebody might later say, what, what about paint? And I'll say, yes, you can do paint, but there are all these other caveats, and so on. So there are lots of reasons why two color is what we decide to go with. It's something we can do very readily. Um, and so our goal was to then uh, create two color particle libraries, as we call that. That just means collecting large data sets in two color. Um, where one color would define the organization of a reference protein and the other color the organization of a new protein, a protein of interest as we call it. And so there are a couple of different ways then that we can use these two color images to define in, in the end um, these two volumes that we want to create. So first of all, um, the nice thing about this is that the reference protein defines the projection angle of that particular particle. And so as long as your reference protein is a good one, and we, why could, we could choose any one that we like, we can choose a good one, then this protein of interest can be something that's very small or very sparsely labeled, and we can still assign its alignment. We don't have to deduce it from its individual particle image. And so this is nice, and it allows us to end up with these two co-oriented volumes. Now, of course, there's still the issue of, of aligning these volumes in um, 3D. So we again take in this two-color particle library, and we use now an orientational filter. So um, Christian, a postdoc in my group, then trained a, uh, this, this uh, little um, um, machine to be able to, uh, or neural network, to be able to recognize top views and side views. So again, the top views can be used for symmetry, and the side views, because in this case, we know that it's a centrosymmetric object, um, we can actually just define the axial distance between these two different volumes. And in this way, we define this, the, the delta z. And so we can then take these individual co-oriented volumes and place them now in three-dimensional space in x, y, z. And so this is an example here of ju doing just that, where we take these different pairs of proteins. CEP152 is always our reference protein. And we can reconstruct then and um, co-orient and position volumes in 3D. So what about cases like the procentriole that I said we were interested in, where you actually don't have this axisymmetry? So in this case, we came up with a different way of aligning the volumes, where instead you reconstruct individually the two volumes, but then you also reconstruct the weighted sum of the two proteins together to create this sort of hybrid protein, a hy hybrid particle, and then you fit those individual volumes into it. Um, and so in this way, we can come up with still two aligned volumes in um, three-dimensional space uh, for a non-axisymmetric particle. And this was, you know, getting us closer to our eventual goal. And one of the fascinating things about this is that we're now able to see that there's, in, the, in this very early growth of the procentriole, there is a symmetry breaking. And it's actually a symmetry breaking from, from um, the basal um, to, the, to the distal end of the, of the procentriole. It actually, they actually tend to point toward um, the uh, distal end, which is kind of bizarre, but, but very interesting. So we provide a, you know, a little software package to go with this. Um, 
I don't have time to go deeply into the last point that I wanted to make, but I wanted to give a little outlook into what we'd like to do next with this kind of microscopy. And what I'd really like to do is to move further into the idea of using um, the, the microscope to, to better, um, well, you, going beyond au just automating a microscope to collect the data that you've programmed it to, to actually going, um, let the microscope be a little bit smarter to be able to recognize what it's seeing in the microscope and then to act on it. So to combine, for example, um, high temporal resolution at some times, uh, at certain time points, and high spatial resolution at others, since there's always these trade-offs, um, to be able to capture very transient events like the division of a cell or the division of a mitochondria or the nucleation of a centriole. So I won't go um, too far into that, but it's this kind of smart microscope idea that um, we're pursuing on the, on the hardware and software end now. Um, so I will end by just showing this uh, picture of my terrific group. I've talked about the work of Christian, um, Kyle, Seamus, uh, Dora, um, as, uh, Amboise is, is not here, he, he's also left recently for a position. And I'll mention that um, there are, I have positions available both at the postdoc and the, the doctoral level. So let me know if you're interested in this kind of science. Thanks.